All right, welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. I'm back here with Connor Leahy, and Connor is, of course, the CEO of Conjecture. Connor, welcome to the podcast. Back again. All right, so how does the strategic landscape of AGI look like right now? Tell me if, tell me if you think this kind of structure is, is approximately true. You have OpenAI and DeepMind in front, followed by the American tech giants like Apple and Google and Meta. And then perhaps you have American startups, and then you have Chinese tech giants and, and startups. Uh, in terms of capabilities, is that the right ordering? Sort of. I would say DeepMind is behind OpenAI by a pretty significant margin right now. Uh, I think Anthropic might actually be ahead of DeepMind at this point. Um, not 100% clear. DeepMind keeps their cards much closer to the chest, so they might have some really impressive eternal things. I've heard some things to that effect, but I don't have evidence of them. So it seems to me OpenAI is clear front center ahead of everyone else. I expect Anthropic will catch up. It seems like they're trying very hard to train their GPT-4 model right now, like the equivalent model right now. I expect they will succeed. Tech giants, I mean, really depends. Like Meta is like pretty far behind. Google is deep mind. Um, Apple doesn't do anything as far as I can tell. So I would, for example, think some startups such as Character are ahead of all of them. Um, like Character AI is a company that was founded by Noam Shazir and others. Noam Shazir being the person who invented the transformer. And you know, they're, they're both folks on chatbots and such, but they're, they're, their models are quite good. They're quite good. So they're, yeah, they're, yeah, that's kind of how I would say, it. yeah, I don't feel that Chinese check giants and startups are very relevant. I think they're really far behind and I don't expect them to catch up anytime soon. Are we simply waiting for the tech American tech giants to make moves here? I, I mean, Apple has a lot of money. They have a lot of talent. They have uh, machine learning chips on all of their iPhones. You could you could easily see an enhanced Siri uh, GPT uh, four style. Sure, but you know Google, which is supposed to be the best of these, couldn't even keep the guy who invented Transformers around because they're so dysfunctional. And then one of the first things I was you know I was told by experienced investors and such when I founded a startup is that like incumbents are not competition; they're all incompetent. It's like all like sure all these things are possible. They have the resources to do these things, but there is a lot of reasons why it could be very hard for large organizations to execute on these kinds of things. Another great example is Bard. So like the chatbot that Google produced, um, it was severely delayed. It you know had lots of problems and it was just like extraordinarily underwhelming compared to what a much smaller group at OpenAI was capable to do in smaller amounts of time. You know, Google is in code red now where, you know, the CEO is personally involved and like everyone's freaking out and they, that doesn't mean they can catch up. Like, you know, just because a lot of people in a boardroom say something should be done and they have a lot of money, that's not enough. It's, there are some things that are actually hard and, you know, training complex cognitive engines like GPT-4 is among those things. Other ones are, for example, like um, chip production, like, you know, China did a huge thing about how they're going to produce their domestic chip production. They're going to catch up to TSMC. And that has now been like slowly like choking in a way because it's just not succeeding because no one in the world other than TSMC can get these ultraviolet machines to work for whatever reason. So it, what we're doing right now in kind of um, describing uh, incumbent technology giants as incompetent, might that be mistaken because perhaps they're hiding they're 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 they're, re they're not they're waiting to release until they have something that's very polished that would be very apple like uh, thing to do perhaps deepmind has something uh, that they're not releasing because they are safety uh, conscious uh, or or is this simply is this kind of wishful thinking wishful thinking okay so 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 the situation is <laughs> that this is interesting because then the situation is kind of how it would look if you're a naive observer. You're just seeing OpenAI making lots of progress. And the, the most legible big players are the most advanced big players. Is that So, so basically, the, the strategic landscape is transparent in that way. It is quite transparent. Like, uh, the truth of the matter is this field is not good with secrecy. This is not like defense contractors where people have a culture of secrecy and like keeping things close to chest. Like Apple is like the only company on this list that like is good at that. DeepMind also, Anthropic is also trying, but 
you know, mixed. If you ask, you know, who's better, you know, Lockheed Martin or like, you know, Airbus fighter jets or whatever, I'm like, okay, I genuinely don't know. <laughs> like, you know, that's like actually hard to know. And like people will actively make it hard for you to know these things. But like all these people have an incentive to make it public how good they are. And they do so quite aggressively when it benefits them. And, you know, Google, you know, scrambled after ChatGPT to catch up with Bard and they put their best effort forward and it was a flop. And, you know, same thing like with Ernie and China and stuff like this. Like, I think, like, don't galaxy brain yourself. Like, it's just what it looks like. And also the AI researchers in the most advanced organizations, they they want their they want to publish research so that they per, perhaps can can move to another organization. They have mo they have interests and incentives that are not uh, not particularly aligned with the company they work for. So there are these there are these publishing norms where your resume as an AI researcher is your published papers. Um, does this make it basically uh, difficult to? Uh, to prevent new advances from from spreading out to to a lot of companies. Yep, that's exactly correct. But if that's the case, why can't Google catch up then? Because there is an additional aspect to it, um, which is execution and tacit knowledge. So especially with large language model training, a massive amount what differentiates a good language model from a decent language model is weird voodoo shit where it's just like someone just has a feeling like, oh, you know, you have to turn down the atom beta 2 decay parameter. Why? Gnome said so, you know? Like, there is a theoretical catch-up, you know, where it's like, you know, you need to come up with the right architecture, or the right algorithms, whatever. But there's also engineering, like just like research and like logistics, like, you know, Setting up a big compute data center is hard and takes a lot of money and time and specialized effort. And also then you need, so there's like a logistical aspect to it. There's also, there's a, you know, will and like, you know, executive capacity that like can an organization commit to doing something like this and like have someone lead it who can like actually manage the complexities involved with it. And then there's a huge aspect of task knowledge of just like the stuff that isn't written down. And there's a lot that is not written down. And that, that tacit tes knowledge might be particularly important in chip production, which could be why, you know, the, the, the giants or the people in front, the companies in front in chip production are, you know, they, they are very difficult to copy. That is exactly correct. Like this is also what people on the inside of like chip production will tell you, that there is a absolutely phenomenally large amount of tacit knowledge that goes into producing high-end computer chips and that like, there's a lot of this task knowledge like only TSMC has, and like they're not writing it down. And even if they wanted to, they probably couldn't. Why is it that, for example, with defense companies or with chip production, there there's a there's a protection of intellectual property in in such companies that we don't see in in AI companies in the in the most kind of secure or, or, or safe uh, secrecy uh, in AI companies is simply to to not say what's happening. You, you don't see that that these uh, company secrets are protected by intellectual property in the same way. Yep. I think this is completely contingent, historical, cultural fact. I think there is no, it didn't have to be this way. I think it was literally just coincidence. It's literally just coincidence that just the personalities of people that like founded this field and like the academic norms that they came from a very academic area there is much less military involvement and much less you know industry involvement initially and there is much more like academics have much more bargaining power in that like um because of the high level of tacit knowledge there is a larger bargaining power that academics have here because like you know if noam shazir wants to publish like he can go wherever he wants so if you don't allow him to he'll just go somewhere else or like whoever you know any high, high profile person but i think this is totally contingent from the perspective of people in ml i think like this is the way things have always been will always be can only be this is obviously wrong because you know you're telling me the people who build like you know stealth fighters are not incredible scientists and engineers like you know give me a break like just because you're a great scientist and engineer doesn't mean they're like you know compelled by their very genomics to like you know want to publish like no this is just a cultural this is just a contingent truth about how the culture happened to have evolved 
as the race to AGI heats up, will we see more 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 closedness? So closed data, closed algorithms. Uh, you see labs not publishing as many papers will these kind of open source uh, norms from the ai researcher community begin to fall apart i hope so we're seeing some of it that's for sure and i hope it accelerates okay as you see it we are already in a race towards agi correct yep obviously so maybe 10 years ago when people were debating ai people would debate whether human level ai is is possible and whether we could whether we could get there within a couple of centuries and so on, perhaps uh, is it time now to retire the the term AGI and to talk about just specific predictions because it's it's people mean a lot of different things. Perhaps if you if you asked uh, Connor Leahy in, in 2010 whether ChatGPT or uh, GPT-4 was an AGI system, what would you have responded? I mean. Depending on how well you described it, I would have said yes, but I do think these things are AGI, so I still do. But it's just like people just don't like my definition of the word AGI, so I don't use that word very much. I agree that the word AGI is not particularly good. It's um, People use it to mean very, very different things. Like by reasonable definitions of AGI that were used like 10 years ago, obviously ChatGPT is AGI, obviously so. Like most of the definitions of AGI from like 10 or 20 years ago were, you know, vaguely can do some human-like things in some scenarios, right? And like, you know, and like, you know, reasonable human level performance on like a pretty wide range of tasks. Obviously, ChatGPT and GPT-4 have reached this level. And obviously, they have the ability to go beyond that. But there's other definitions that they don't fulfill, you know, like strictly better at humans at literally everything. Like, sure, you know, ChatGPT is not that. But also, lol. Like, what are you doing? Perhaps that's not super interesting. There will always be 2% that where humans are just better. Sure. Or people are just, you know, testing it wrong or just not bothering to do it or whatever. So, like, the, the real definition of AGI that I am most interested in personally is more vague than that. And it's something like a system that has the thing that humans have that chimps don't. It's like, you know, a thing that, you know, you know, human brains are basically scaled up chimp brains, you know, by like a factor of like three or four or something. They're all the same structures, all the same kind of things internally, blah, blah, blah. But humans go to the moon, chimps don't. So, you know, there's some people who are like, oh, okay, but like, you know, there's always going to be some task that a specialized, you know, tool, like, you know, an AGI couldn't fold proteins as good as alpha fold or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. AGI, maybe you can't fold proteins as good as alpha fold but it can invent alpha fold. So the relevant thing I'm personally interested in is just like a thing that is powerful enough to learn and do science and to pose potentially existential risks to humanity. Like those are the things I personally care about. And when I talk about AGI, that's generally what I'm referring to, but I agree it's a bad meme, like it's a bad word because other people, as I've said before, some people when they hear AGI, they think like, you know, friendly human robot buddy who's like, you know, sort of smart as you, but not really smarter, you know, but other people think, you know, AGI is godlike super thing that can do everything, a lot of intermediate things. Uh, yeah, you know, we can, we can have an, we can have a semantic fight about this, but I don't know. So perhaps a way to resolve these uh, issues is to make predictions. Uh, do you, would you be willing to, to make a prediction about when, for example, a an academic paper created by an AI model would get published in, say, a, a reasonably high quality scientific journal. That's underdefined. It's like, does the system, how much human inter intervention is allowed here? Do I give it a prompt? Does it have to man, you know, navigate the website and upload the paper itself? Say, say you, you, give it a, you can give it a detailed prompt uh, and the system simply has to create the paper and nothing else. Okay, so... Do, does this have to have actually occurred or be possible? Because possible yesterday uh, actually occurred. I think just no one's gotten around to it. Like just no one's bothered to do this. You think this could be done now? Yeah, absolutely. Like obviously so. Like the, you know the SoCal affair, you know, already got papers published. You know, you know, decades ago, which complete nonsense. I think you could have done this with GPT two probably if you if you allow like non STEM journals. You maybe need GPT three for STEM journals, but like. Have you read ML papers? Like so many of them are so awful. Like this is like not that hard. So you think this is basically already here now? Oh yeah, absolutely. 
but I think this is not capturing the thing you're interested in. The thing I think you're probably interested in is that, like, can it do science? You're not interested in can it trick reviewers into thinking something is good. So the question of when will the thing publish a scientific paper, which are what I expect, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I expect you're looking for is the question, when can it do science? You're not looking for the question, how stupid are peer reviewers? True. So how, how, how can we make this question interesting then? Is it, is it how, when can, a, can an AI system publish a scientific paper that gets cited a lot? Or, or is that also simply kind of uh, a way of gaming the system? Or So there's various ways we can think about this. And, and I'm going to give the unsatisfying, but I think correct answer, which is by the time it can do that, it's too late. If you have a system that can fulfill whatever good criteria you can actually come up with, that actually means you can do actual science, it's too late. And I expect at that point, if we have not aligned such a system, if you're not creating from things, then you know, end times are upon us and we do not have much time left, if any. If you ask me to bet on these things or like, you know, do you know, with my real money, I just like wouldn't because I like I don't expect the bet to pay out. Do you expect AIs to publish uh, credible scientific papers before they can empty a dishwasher? Credible or correct? Those are different. Correct, interesting scientific papers. I expect that to happen probably before the dishwasher, yeah. I can make a concrete prediction. I expect the world to end before, you know, like m- more than 10% of cars on the street are autonomous. Okay. So what what we have here is is a scenario in which we are close to to transformative AI we could call it uh, or perhaps deadly AI. If we are very close, does this mean that the the game board is kind of settled in a sense? The the big players are the the players that are going to take us all the way there. So for example, we could ask is it open AI that ends up creating transformative AI? Seems pretty likely in the current trajectory if nothing changes if government doesn't get involved if you know culture doesn't shift if people don't revolt then yeah i expect you know open ai deep mind anthropic 80 percent one you know 70 percent one of them and like you know lot rest percentage like smeared over you know like other actors or like actors that haven't yet merged are we are we getting hyped up on an exponential curve that's about to flatten off so will we, for example, because we run out of data or we run out of accessible compute or something of that nature, this is not something you see you, you see coming? I don't see any reason to expect this. My general predictions are usually predict what, if you don't know what the future is going to hold, predict that what just happened will happen again. And this is what I'm seeing. We're at the beginning of an, ex, you know, we're, we're now in takeoff, you know, expenditures are happening. And will this flatten off at some point? Yeah, sure. I just expect that to be post-apocalypse. Let's take a tour of the landscape of uh, different alignment solutions or AI safety solutions. So the current paradigm that's that's used by OpenAI, for example, is that you train on human-created data, and then you do reinforcement learning from human feedback, kind of fine-tuning the model afterwards. If nothing changes, if we are very close to transformative AI, if it perhaps transformative AI is is uh, will be developed by OpenAI, could this succeed as as a as a last option? Do you, do you think uh, that uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback could take us to something at least somewhat uh, safe systems? No, there's there's no chance of, of this paradigm working. No, like it's not it's not even an alignment solution. It's not a proposal. I don't think the people working on it will even claim that. Like I'm pretty certain that if you asked like Paul Cristiano or something like, is RLHF a solution to alignment? They would just he would just say no. And for context, Paul Cristiano basically invented uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. Yeah, he was one of the core people involved in it. And I don't think he, I mean, maybe some people involved in the creation would claim this, I don't know. But I would expect that if you ask the people who create these methods, is this an alignment solution? They would say no, and they don't expect this to work. Like, I don't think that RLHF in any way addresses any of the actual problems of alignment. It is a... The core problem of alignment is how do you get a very complex, powerful system that you don't understand to reliably do something complicated that you can't fully specify in domains where you cannot supervise it. It's you know the principal agent problem writ large. RLHF does not address this problem. It doesn't even claim to suggest this problem. There's no reason to expect that RLHF should solve this problem. This is like, it's like, you know, 
clicker training an alien. You know, it's like, you know, there is every time you do an RLHF update, so you can, you know, if for those are not familiar, you kind of imagine it's simplified as the, you know, the model produces some text and you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And then you do a gradient update to like, you know, make it more or less likely to do the stuff. You have no idea what is in that gradient. There is no idea what it is learning, what it is updating on. You know, let's say, you know, your model threatens some users or whatever, and you're saying like, oh, that's bad. So you give it a thumbs down. Well, what does the model learn from this? Well, one thing it might learn is don't threaten users. Another thing it might learn is don't get caught threatening users, or it could learn use less periods or, you know, um, don't use the word green or like, like, like who knows? Like it, and it, in practice, what it's going to learn is, is a superposition of like all of these, like, or like tons of these possible explanations. And it's going to, you know, change itself, like the minimum amount to like fulfill this criteria or like move in that direction and in that domain. But you have no reason to expect this to generalize. Maybe it does. Sure. Maybe it does. But maybe it doesn't. Like, you have no reason to expect it to. There is no theory. There is no prediction. There is no safety. It is like, you know, it's like the, you know, Seafried and Roy and the tiger, right? It's like, well, you know, we've raised it from birth. It's so nice. And then it mauls you. Like, why? Who knows? Tiger had a bad day. I don't know. Perhaps the counter argument to something like this is that it's only when we begin interacting with these systems in an empirical way that we can actually make progress. Uh, the, the 10 years of alignment r research before, uh, say, 2017, didn't really bring us any closer. It was only when, when OpenAI began uh, interacting with real systems that, that we understood how they even worked and therefore perhaps uh, gained information about how to align them. Do you buy that? No. And, and because? I mean, like, which part of that is true? Like, A... The saying that like no progress happened when it was like, you know, three people in the basement working on it with no funding is like, what the hell are you talking about? A, like, like given it was three people in the basement, they made a lot of progress on predicting things that would happen on deconfusing concepts on, you know, building an ontology for things that don't yet exist. This was extremely impressive given the extremely low amount of effort put into this. And, you know, sure, they didn't like, you know, they didn't solve alignment. Sure, but like, has any progress happened in alignment since then? It's like not obvious to me that there's been more people using the word. There's a lot more papers about it, but like, and like, there's stuff like RLHF and stuff. I don't consider RLHF to be progress in a sense as regression. It's like the fact that anyone, and this is not to, meant to be as a critique per se of the people who did RLHF because I think they were fully aware that, hey, this is not alignment. This is just an interesting thing we want to study a little bit, which I think. Is Totally fair. It's so legitimate, uh, you know. And like RLHF has its purpose. It's you know, it's a great way to make your product nicer, right? As like a capabilities method, RLHF is totally fine. Like you know, just don't delude yourself into thinking that this is, you know, I don't buy this whole like. Well, if it makes the a model behave better in some subset of scenarios, this is progress towards alignment. I think this is a really bad way of thinking of the problem. It's like saying. Well, if I hide my password file two folders deep, then that is security. Because, you know, there are some scenarios where an attacker would not think to look two folders deep. And I'm like, sh sure, in like some trivial sense, that's true. But like, that's obviously not what we mean when we talk about security. It's like, if you, enc if you encrypt the password file, but your encryption is bad, I'm like, okay, that's progress, but your encryption is bad. I'm like, all right, cool. This is obviously safety. I accept this as safety, but now I have problems with your encryption you know, system. That is progress on alignment that we can argue about. You moving a thing, your, your password.txt, two folders deep, I do not consider progress. You weren't even trying to solve the problem. You were trying to do something different. You know. You, you don't think that uh, Microsoft's uh, Bing chat or Sydney uh, was less aligned than uh, chat GPT for? Not in the ways I care about. Like, it's you, I think this is a stretching of what I use the term alignment for. So, like, you can make that statement. I'm, this, I think this is a completely legitimate way of defining the word alignment if you want to define it that way. That is an okay thing to do. But it's not the thing I care about. I do not expect that if I had an unaligned 
existential risk AGI, and I did the chat GPT equivalent to it, that that saves you. I think that gives you nothing, you die anyways. Nature doesn't grade on a curve. Like just because you're, you know, 10% better, if you don't meet the mark, you still die. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if on, you know, your smiley face was a little 10% larger than the next guy's smiley face. If you're only painting lar you know, incrementally larger smiley faces, it doesn't matter. So what about extrapolations from reinforcement learning from human feedback? For example, having AIs uh, work to give feedback on other AIs, uh, could that maybe scale uh, to, to something that would be more interesting for you? Why would you expect that to work? Like, where does the safety come from here? There is no step in this process where you actually are addressing the core difficulty of how do you deal with a system that will get more smart, that will reflect upon itself, that will learn more, that is fundamentally alien with fundamentally alien goals encoded in ways we do not understand can access or modify, that is extrapolating into larger and larger domains that we cannot supervise. No part of this addresses this problem. It's like you can play shell games with where the difficulty is until you confuse yourself sufficiently to thinking it's fine. This is a very common thing. It happens in science all the time, especially in, crypt in cryptography. There's a saying, everyone can create a code complex enough that they themselves can't break it. And this is a similar thing here, where I think everyone can create an alignment scheme sufficiently complicated that they themselves think it's safe. But so what? Like, if you don't, if you just confuse where the safety part is, that doesn't actually give you safety. What would be evidence that you're wrong or right here? For example, if it turns out that the GPT model that's that's available right now is not used to create, uh, you know, havoc in the world, it's not used to to scam people, and turns out to to not be be dangerous in in the sense that we expected. Would this be evidence that perhaps OpenAI is doing something right? So it, a proof of this would be is that no one on the entire internet can find any way to make a model say something bad. Like there's no prompt that can be found that makes it say something OpenAI doesn't want it to say. Perhaps not, not say something bad. It's, it's, not, it's not specifically about bad words no, or no, something. No, no, this it's, is actually quite important. This is yeah. quite important because okay. what OpenAI is trying to do is to stop the model from saying bad things. That's what they were trying to make it do, and they failed. That's the interesting thing. If they had an alignment technique that actually worked, that I expect might have a chance to work on super intelligent system, it should be able to make your less smart systems never in any scenario say a bad thing. So it should be much more, it should work in, in almost all cases or basically all cases for, all for cases. you. So importantly, it has to be all cases because if it's not all cases, then I, uh, unless you have some extremely good theoretical reason why actually this is okay, but by default, these are black boxes. I don't accept any assumptions. Unless you give me a theory, a causal story about why I should relax my assumptions, then I'm like, well, if it's breakable, it will break. And this is the security mindset. The difference between security mindset and ordinary paranoia is ordinary paranoia assumes things are safe until proven otherwise. Security mindset assumes things are unsafe until proven otherwise. And sure, you can't apply security mindset to literally everything all the time because you go crazy, right? Sure. But when we're dealing with existential threats of extremely powerful, superhuman, optimizing systems, systems whose whole purpose is to re optimize reality into weird, you know, edge cases, to, to, find, to break systems, to glitch, to, to, you know, enforce power upon systems. This is exactly the type of system you have to have a security mindset for, because if you have a system that's looking for a hole in your walls, you can't, and you have one small hole, that's not good enough. If you have a system which is you know, randomly probing your wall and you have one small hole, yeah, maybe that's fine. If it's small enough, that's okay. But it's not okay if it is deliberately looking for the small hole and if it's really good at finding them. What about the, the industry of cybersecurity, for example? You would assume that they have a security mindset, or at least they should have. But accidents happen all the time, data is leaked and so on. So <laughs> isn't that evidence that we can survive that we can survive situations where we should have had secure where where there are holes in our security so so it's not actually true that systems have to work 100% of the time the fact that we survived has not anything to do with the security measure it has to do with the systems being secure and not being existential if those systems had been existentially dangerous HGIs, yes i expect we would be dead 
it's only because of the limited capabilities of these systems that can be hacked and then have been hacked and so on. Exactly. Let's, let's take another paradigm of AI safety, which is mechanistic interpretability. And this is about uh, understanding what this black box uh, machine learning system is doing, trying to reverse engineer the algorithm that produced the neural network uh, weights. Is this, is this a, a hopeful paradigm in your opinion? I think it's definitely something worth it, worth working on. It's something that you know many people conjecture work on as well. I think the way I think about interpretability is not as a re- as a alignment agenda. Like alignment, like interpretability doesn't solve alignment. It might give us tools with which we can construct an aligned system. It might allow. It's like the way I I think about it in my ontology is that I think of mechanistic interpretability as attempting to move cognition from black box neural networks into white boxes. Again, as I've said before, black box is observer dependent. You know, neural networks are not inherently black box. It's not like an inherent property of the territory. It's a property of the map. If you have extremely good interpretability in your head and extremely good theory and extremely, you know, a lot of compute in your head and whatever, then a neural network would probably look like a white box to you. And if that is the case, fantastic. Now you can like, you know, found lots of things and maybe like stop it from doing bad things and whatever. And so I expect this. So this is like, like this is the default thing I tell people to do if they don't know what to do. If they're like, I don't know what to do with alignment or safety. I'm just like, okay, just work on interpretability. Just like, just like try, just like, just like bash your head against it. Just see what happens. Um, not because I think it's easy. I expect this to be very hard. I also think a lot of the current paradigm of mechanistic interpretability is not great. I think a lot of people are making simplifying assumptions I think they should be making. But um, in general, I'm in favor, and I think this is good. It's one problem, or perhaps the main problem with uh, interpretability research is just the question of whether it can move fast enough. So we are just beginning to understand the some interesting uh, clusters of neurons in in uh, GPT two, but right now GPT five is being trained, and so can it keep up with the pace of progress? Do you think it can? I mean, the same applies to like literally every other thing. My my default answer is no. I don't expect things to go well. Like again, I expect things to go poorly. I do not expect us to solve alignment on time. I expect things will not slow down sufficiently. I expect things will continue, and I expect us to die. I expect this is the default outcome of the default world we are currently living in. This doesn't mean it has to happen. There is this important thing that you know. The world being the way it is, is not overdetermined. It didn't have to be this way. The way the world currently is, the path we are currently on, is not determined by God. It is because of decisions that humans have made. Individual humans have made decisions and institutions and so on have made decisions and you know done things in the past that have led us to the moment we are in right now. This was not overdetermined. It didn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to continue to be this way, but it will if nothing changes. So I ex- do I expect interpretability to work on time? No. Do I expect COEM to work on time? No. Do I expect RLHF to work ever? No. I don't expect any of these things to work. That doesn't mean it's impossible if we take action, if things change, if we slow down, or if we make some crazy breakthroughs or whatever. I think, I think interpretability is like, I think there is a lot that can be done here. You know, I think there is a lot of theory. There's a lot of, you know, things that can be done here. Will they happen in, will they, ha- like, are they possible to happen? Yes. Will they happen in time? Probably not. Then there is the research done by Paul Cristiano and Elie Isaacowski at the uh, Alignment Research Center and the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. This is something that's, that's for me at least, difficult to understand. As I see it, it is, it is attempting to make a, uh, to, to, to use mathematics to prove something about the, the background assumptions that uh, in which alignment is uh, is situated. What do, you, what do you think of this research paradigm? Should we have, I mean, <laughs> is there any hope here? So I feel like both Paul and Eliezer would scream if you put them in the same bucket. I think their research is actually very different. Um, so just to say a few words on that, um, the straw man, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm specifically straw manning because you uh, Eliezer and Paul are some of the most difficult people to get their true opinions right. So basically every single person I know completely mischaracterizes Paul, even people who know him very well. Like whenever someone very, who knows Paul very well, I ask them what Paul believes, they tell me X. And then I ask Paul, he tells me something different. So like, I, I think, 
I don't think this is malicious. I think it's just it, Paul and Yukowski's opinions are very subtle and very complex and communicating them is hard. So I am prefacting this that I am definitely misunderstanding what Paul and Eliezer truly believe. I can just give my best straw man. So my best straw man I can give for a Cristiano view is that he works on currently something called ELK, which is eliciting latent knowledge. It's kind of like this attempt to add that plus another thing that I'm aware of where he's trying to like think of worst case scenarios. How can you get like true knowledge out of like neural networks? How can you get their true beliefs about system or not necessarily networks, like any system, like arbitrary system, how, even if they're deceptive. And also related to that, he does some like semi-formal work about like proofs and like causal, causal tracing through neural networks and stuff like this. I This is a straw man. This is definitely not an accurate description of what he actually does, but this is the closest I can get. While Eliezer, um, well, he's currently on hiatus. He's currently on sabbatical. So I don't think he's currently doing any research actually. But historically, what Miri, the, in the organization that he founded, does is kind of building formal models of agency, like trying to deconfuse agency and intelligence on a far more fundamental level than building, like, you know, just doing some code and trying to build an AI and then figuring out how to align it. It's way more thinking from first principles. What is an agent? What is optimization? What would it mean for systems to be aligned or corrigible? Can we like express these things formally? How can like systems know that you know they or their successors will be aligned? How can they prove things about themselves? How would they coordinate or like work together? Blah, work on like decision theory on embedded agency and stuff like this. So I think a lot of the Miri paradigm is um a lot more subtle than, and then, and I understand the Miri paradigm better than I do Paul. Um, I think a lot of it is very subtle, but actually I think a lot of the Miri work is very good. I think it's very good work. I think it's really interesting. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, so when people talk about like formal mathematical theories, blah, 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 they often refer for, I think, to like something that I think Eliezer said in the sequences, where he's like, the only way to get aligned AGI is like formally proof checked, full thing, you know, solve all of alignment in theory, and then, you know, build AGI. I don't know if he still believes this. He probably does, but I've just, I'm just saying, I just don't know. I haven't, I don't think I've asked him. Maybe I've asked him, but I don't remember his answer. Um, and I don't think Paul believes this. I'm a, I, I, like Paul, last time I talked to him, again, this is a straw man, please don't hold me to this, Paul, sorry if I'm misrepresenting you here. Um, my understanding is that he has like, you know, 30% P-Doom even in, on the current path or something like that, which obviously isn't going through formal methods. So by that, I deduce that he doesn't expect this to be necessary. If that's wrong, I apologize. That's just my impression that Paul is quite open to non-formal things and neural networks and that kind of stuff. Well, Eliezer kind of has this belief that like, if we, if it's just neural networks, we're super screwed. We're just super, super screwed. There's nothing we can do. It's way too hard. So like a lot of the Miri perspective, I think is that like aligning neural networks is so hard that we have to develop something that is in neural networks that is easier to align. And then you have to use that instead. And this has been not super successful as far as I can tell. My view on this is not sure about Paul's agenda, bit pessimistic. I'm pretty pessimistic about Elk. It seems too hard. Um, pretty pessimistic about that. Don't really understand the other stuff he's working on. Can't really comment on that. Um, I definitely disagree with him on some points about interpretability and um, P Doom and such. I think he's too optimistic about many things. But every time when I bring this up, he actually then has good counterpoints. So maybe he has some good counterpoints I just don't know about. For Eliezer, I agree that in a good world, that's what we would do. Like I think in a good world where people are, are sane and like coordinated and we take lots of time, we would do much more Miri like things. Not necessarily exactly what Miri da, did. I think some of the exact details of like Miri's research agenda are like not what I would have done, but like the general like class of things like let's deconfuse agency let's deconfuse alignment corrigibility and then like try to build formal models and like try to understand this. i think this is super sensible i think this is like a super sensible thing to do it didn't work 
in this one specific instance, given the constraints they had, I don't think that means the entire class of methodology is, you know, ontologically flawed and like cannot possibly work. I'm just like, you know, they tried, they found some things that I find interesting and other things didn't work out. Like, bro, that's how science works. And perhaps, perhaps it could have worked if we had started in 1950 working on this and had developed it alongside the, you know, the general mathematics of computation or something like that. Yep. I think this is completely feasible. I think it's completely possible that just like if things had gone slightly differently or just, you know, if Miri had, you know, one more John von Neumann get involved and get really into it at the early days, like, you know, I think it's not obvious that this is a hundred years away or something like this. Um, it might be. But it's not obvious to me. Like things always feel impossibly far away until they're not. People thought, you know, flying machines were hundreds of years away the day before it happened. Same thing with like, you know, nuclear fusion and like fit fission and like stuff like that. So like it's I feel like Miri gets a bad rap. Is that sure they made some technical bets and they didn't quite work out, but I think that's like fair. So I'm pretty sympathetic to the Yudkowsky view. Even so, I am uh, so my personal view is kind of like, we're at the point, it's a strategic decision. Like, okay, if I had, if I knew I had 50 years, I'd probably work on mirror relay stuff, but I'm like, all right, I don't have 50 years. So I'm t like the kind of co stuff I work on is more of a compromise between the various positions where we're like, all right, there's a spectrum between fully formal, everything white box and nothing formal, completely black box. Let's try to move to as far towards the formal things possible, but no further kind of. That makes any sense. It does. So perhaps introduce Coems these cognitive emulations. Yeah. So uh, cognitive emulation or Coem is the agenda that I and Conjecture are primarily focused on right now. It is a proposal for, or for a well, more a research agenda for how we could get towards more safe, useful, powerful AI systems by fundamentally trying to build bounded, understandable systems that emulate human-like reasoning, not arbitrary reasoning, not like they just solve the problem by whatever means necessary, but they solve it in the way humans would solve a problem, in a way that you can understand. So when you use a CoM system, and so these are systems, not models. Like I don't expect this to be like, this is not a neural network. This is like a, it may involve neural networks. It probably does involve neural networks, but it'll be like a you know, system of many subcomponents which can include neural networks, but it will also include non-neural network components. That when you use such a system, at the end, you get a causal story. You get a, a reason to believe that you can understand using human-like reasoning why it made the choices it did, why it did the things it did, and why you should trust the output to be valid in this regard. Yeah, and for listeners who were enticed by that description, uh, they should go back and listen to the previous podcast in this series where Conan and me, we discussed this for an hour and a half. All right, so as we see more and more uh, capable AI systems, do you expect us to also see more and more public attention? Do you expect uh, public attention to, to kind of scale with, with capabilities? Or will public attention uh, lag behind and only come in uh, right at, at the very end? Both in that I think we're at the very end and we're sorry to see the attention now. Okay. Do you think that this will on, on net be a positive or a negative? So will public attention to AI make AI safer? At the current point, I see it as positive. Um, it's not obvious. It could still go negative very easily. But the way I currently see things is, is that all of the, everyone is racing headlong into the abyss and at least what the public so far, in my experience, been able to do is to notice, hey, wait, what the fuck? Don't do that. Which is great progress, as far as I can tell. It is truly maddening how many smart, you know, ML professors and whatever are so incredibly, utterly resistant to the possibility that what they're doing might be bad or might be dangerous. It is incredible the level of rationalization that people are capable of. I mean, it's not incredible. Like, it's actually very expected. This is exactly what you expect. They rely on a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And even the people who claim to understand it and say all the right words, like, you know, they still do it. 
like, you know, OpenAI can say all the nice words about alignment they want or Anthropic or DeepMind or whatever. They're still racing to AGI and they don't have an alignment solution. So I don't like speculating about people's like internal minds or like, why are they doing it? Are they good? Are they aligned? Or I don't really care. What I care about is what they do. And for me, the writing is on the wall. Just people are just careening towards the abyss. And if no intervention happens, if nothing changes, they will just go straight off that cliff with all of us in tow. And I think the public, you know, even so they don't understand many things and there's many ways in which they can make things worse, do seem to understand the very, very simple concept of don't careen off abyss into the abyss. Stop that right now. So here, here's an argument. Uh... OpenAI releases GPT-4, and this draws a lot of attention, and therefore we get more resources into regulation and, and AI safety research and so on. And so it, it's actually a good thing to release a model that's that's very capable, but not a super intelligent AGI. It, is this, is this uh, galaxy brain, is this 4D chess, or do you think there's something there? Sure, there's something there, but it is also just obviously 4D chess. Like It's like, okay... If you had a theory with which you could predict where the abyss is, sure, okay, there is no such theory. You have no idea what these systems can do when people get their hands on it. You have no idea what happens when you augment them with tools or whatever. You have no idea what these things can do. There's no bounds, there's no limit, there's whatever. So every time you release a model, every time you build such a model, you're rolling a die. And, you know, maybe this time's fine. Maybe next time's fine. But at some point, it won't be fine. It's Russian roulette. Sure, you know, you can you can play some Russian roulette. Most of the time, it's fine. You know, five out of six people say Russian roulette is fine. What about uh, possible counterproductive overreactions from more public attention to AI? For example, imagine that we decide to pause AI research, but AI safety research gets lumped in with AI capabilities research. And so even though we're not making any progress on capabilities, we're not making any progress on safety either. And when we lift this pause, we are in the same place as when we uh, instigated it. Honestly, I'd be extremely surprised if that happened. Like, I'm trying to imagine how that would actually play out in the real world. Like, people won't even accept, like, a moratorium on training things larger than GPT-4, which is, like, the easiest thing to implement, the easiest thing to monitor that affects, like, you know, a teeny tiny sliver of all AI research. Like, there are so few people that could or ever would train a gpt 4 size model. And... You know, that's such a teeny tiny sliver of AI research. And not even that is like feasible in the current political world. It's like very hard to get done. It's like an overreach so large that, you know, miry doodling, you know, type theory on their whiteboards gets shut down. I'm like, oh, that's a not the world we live in. Like if we were in that world, I would be like, okay, interesting. Um, let's talk about it. But this is just not the world we live in. What about AI becoming a military technology and only the only militaries can work on it and perhaps they work on it in ways that uh, turn out to be dangerous? Yep, I am concerned about this. I think this is one of the ways things can go really badly. Um, I used to be more virulently against this than I am now. Now, in another sense, I look at where we're currently heading and I'm like, all right, currently we have a 100% doom chance. What are the other options, right? And... So look, I'm not going to defend like many of the atrocities committed by militaries across the world or whatever, right? I'm not going to say that there's not problems here. I'm not going to like say deny that there's some really fucked up people involved in these in these organizations or anything like that. Of course there are, but also um, at least in the democratic West, you know, don't want to speak about other nations, but like there is such a thing as oversight. Like there are court marshalings. Like this is an actual thing, it actually happens. In a sense, the military is authoritarian in a good way. Like the, the military is very authoritarian. There is hierarchy, there is authority, there is accountability, there is structure. Like there is, like the US military does a lot of bad things, but at least to some degree, they are accountable to the American public. Like not perfectly, there's lots of problems here, but like if a Senator wants a hearing to investigate something going on in the military, they can usually get it, which, you know, is not perfect you know, huge problems or whatever, but I'm like, that's something. And like, people do look like, you know, politicians do care 
you know, um, they might make very stupid mistakes and they might make stupid things and they might make things worse. Like the DoD could scale up, you know, like, you know, GPT-4 very easily. They could make something much bigger than that. You know, if they if they did a Manhattan project and they, you know, put all the money together to create, you know, GPT, you know, you know, GPTF, you know, just like end of the world system, then they they could and that would be bad. Um, so I think it can make it worse, but it's not obviously so. It's not like it could also be that they, you know, a like also it's just like super incompetent, slow, you know, bureaucratic mess. And the military is very conservative. Like very, very conservative about what they deploy, about what they do. They want extremely high levels of, of security. They want extremely high levels of reliability before they use anything. Like if we built AI systems to military standard of like reliability, like like the military re requested that like every AI system is like, you know, as reliable as a flight control system, I would be like, well, that sounds fucking great. Like uh, that sounds awesome. Of course, that is a rosy view, like probably... When mil I, I think it's not a question of if military gets involved. I think it's a question of when. And when this happens, it probably, as the law of undignified failure goes, if a thing can fail, it will always fail in the least dignified way possible. So probably it won't get to this level. But I think we should not dismiss out of hand that, I mean, for, first of all, I think it's ridiculous to accept that the military will not get involved. I think this is just impossible at this point, unless we get, you know, paperclip tomorrow. Like on things, unless things go so fast that no one can react, military will get involved and we should work with them. We should be there to like, be like, all right, how can we help the military handle this as non-stupidly as possible? And I do think that a lot of people that work in the military do care and would like things to be safe and work well. So is it worse than, you know, Sam Altman, you know, all like Dr. Strange love style, you know, is running, you know, things as fast as possible? Is it worse if, you know, the military nationalizes the whole thing and grinds into this bureaucratic monstrosity? Not obvious to me. I'm not saying I know obviously it is good, but it's not obviously not good. All right. Gonna thank you for coming on the podcast. Pleasure as always.